Radio. It's time for Grounded in the Word with your teacher, Jacob Prash. Jacob teaches the whole counsel of God using the same Jewish interpretation of the Old Testament as Jesus and his apostles did 2,000 years ago. You will want to grab a pen and paper and take notes as you get grounded in God's Word. Your best defense against falling for error in these perilous times. Come with me again, please, to First John. First John, once again, please, chapter 2. I'd like to point out that many of my closest friends, many of my closest friends, people who I esteem greatly in the Lord, people who I've learned things from, and I'm including Dave Hunt, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, I'm including uh, certainly David Hawking, people like Tim LaHaye, many people who I generally like and broadly agree with, would disagree with me and some other people on one point. I'm of the view personally, and if you take a different view, I have no problem with that, but my personal understanding of Scripture, and I'm quite sure it's correct, but others would vociferously disagree, is that the rapture and resurrection will not happen until the faithful Christians know who the Antichrist is. Now, to me, it is not a fundamental of the faith. It doesn't make you a heretic. If you do or don't believe it, it's not essential to salvation, but I'm absolutely convinced this is the case. We are told directly in Second Thessalonians the Episunagage will not come until the apostasia comes and the man of lawlessness is revealed. You'd have to engage in reductio ad absurdum argumentation to get around what it plainly says in Greek and in English. But again, I have friends who disagree. Also, the idea of the number of the beast, um, that he who has wisdom count the number of the beast. Jesus is our wisdom. If we're not here, who's going to count it? Uh, that is my view. Um, I know some are wondering. That's, I only mentioned it in passing. Look at First John, please, again, chapter 2. Verse 22. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Messiah? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. Any religion that denies the triunity of the Godhead. Now, I don't care about the word Trinity. I don't care if somebody uses it or doesn't use it. But we had somebody here last night from a oneness church. This oneness heresy is an ancient heresy called Sabellianism. The Father is Jesus, Jesus is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is Jesus. Uh, when Jesus appeared at the death of Stephen, when Stephen was being martyred, Stephen looked into heaven and he beheld Jesus at the right hand of the Father. Did he see one or did he see two? Well, I've actually heard one of the wondrous people say, this is actually true. If somebody was throwing rocks at you when you were getting hit in the head, you'd be seeing double as well. It would be highly presumptuous of anybody to say we can fully understand the nature of the triunity of the Godhead this side of eternity. But we can understand it enough to know it exists and it is true. And again, the term Trinity was Trinitas in Latin was first used by Tertullian at some point later. Uh, I'm not talking about the term Trinity. Or even the Athanasian Creed that was later people trying to defend the Trinity, uh, those who were denying it. The word Trinity, I don't care anything about it. But God does reveal himself as one God in three persons. We can only understand this up to a certain point. But if people deny it, look out, the spirit of Antichrist is at work. If the Father and the Son, they are different. Now how do we understand it? Well, to begin with, we are imagio dei beings, imagio dei beings. God said, let us, plural, make man in our image and our likeness. Okay, who is he talking to? He imparted certain aspects of his divine natures to males and certain to females. Okay? Uh, that between the two, they would reproduce his image and likeness. When they asked Jesus the greatest commandment, Jesus said, Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Achad Baruch Shem Kvodo Umachuto Leolam Vaed Vachavtecha Adonai Elohecha Ankol Levevecha Kol Nafshecha Uvamakol Modecha here, O Israel, the Lord our God is oneness, a had, a plural oneness, 
not yahid, not the number one, but a oneness, a plural oneness. It is the same thing you have in Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in oneness, unity. It is the plural oneness, a compound oneness. Now this word one, achad, oneness, is the same word used for not only the divine nature, God is oneness, but Adam and Eve shall become achad. The Hebrew idiom for consummating a marriage that you'll see in the Old Testament, like with Ruth and this, is niknasba, niknasba. And he went into her, and the Lord allowed her to conceive. And he went into her, and the Lord allowed her to conceive. One person goes inside of another person, and a third person is procreated. It is one in three, it is three in one, okay? Marital romance, marital human reproduction in holy matrimony reflects the Trinity. One inside of another, well, then, then the Lord allows her to conceive. Well, is it one in three, or is it three in one? Well, <laughs> well metabolically, a fetus is dependent on its mother, it's, 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 it's dependent, you know, you can get sepsis, the mother gets sick, the fetus is going to get sick, something goes wrong with the fetus, it can affect the mother's cell. Well, it's one, but it's two, but it's one. That reflects something about the Godhead, a dim view. The other is, being imagio dei beings, made in God's image and likeness, we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. The reason we have a body and a soul and a spirit is because it reflects our maker. Who knows the mind of the Father? The soul corresponds to the Father. The Holy Spirit, obviously, corresponds to our spirit. We have a spirit because God does. And, of course, the word became flesh. Body corresponds to Jesus. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit because somehow that reflects our maker. Okay? Now, suppose you were really tired, really tired, long day at work, stuck in a traffic jam, you're really tired. You just want to go to sleep. And all of a sudden, the Lord puts an unsaved person in front of you who's open to the gospel, and you have an opportunity to witness to somebody who's really open. <laughs> well, your body wants to go to sleep. Your spirit <laughs> wants you to share Jesus with that person. Your body has one will, your spirit has another. <laughs> okay? In the divine nature... There's no disparity in the will, you understand? The Father, the Son, and the Spirit, they do not have that kind of fragmentation in their will. Their will is one, okay? Their will is one. There's a perfect harmony in their will. But the fact that we have these three components that can be the same person but different people. When you die, you give up the ghost. <laughs> There's the corpse, but you're still conscious in eternity. But... There's the cause. Well, okay. These things teach about our Maker. We are made in God's image and likeness. We are triune, we are tripartite because our Maker is. Any cult like Jehovah's Witnesses, any so called church, including the United Pentecostals, who deny the triunity of the Godhead, keep away. It is spirit of Antichrist. We must understand the father-son relationship. If that is denied, you're dealing with the spirit of Antichrist. Now let's understand this even further. David rightly pointed out there's a quotation from the Sorah and the Koran on the dome of the rock on the Temple Mount. God has no son. Allah is not begotten, neither does he beget. Islam is an Antichrist religion in every sense of the word. One, Jesus is the Logos. He's the Word of God incarnate. It has what Jude's epistle calls a pseudo-logon, another Word of God, a false Word of God, the Koran. Secondly, it says that Mohammed was greater than Christ in place of Christ, Antichrist. And, of course, it denies the father-son relationship. God has no son. Islam is an Antichrist religion. However, let's get more basic than this. The Judaism you see today is called Talmudic Judaism, Rabbinic Judaism. The Jewish religion as it exists now is not the Jewish religion of Moses, 
and the Hebrew prophets. It is not the Judaism of the Torah. There is no temple, there is no ritual sacrifice, there is no Levitical priesthood, there is no high priest. Biblical Judaism has not existed since 70 A.D. The Messiah would come and die before the second temple would be destroyed. According to Daniel. Okay. Judaism, rabbinic Judaism. We have to understand there's three kinds of Judaism. The first kind of Judaism is the Judaism of Moses and the prophets, based on the Torah. Perfectly valid, but no longer exists. The second Judaism is Messianic Judaism, those Jews who believe Jesus is the Messiah and fulfills the Torah, perfectly valid, still does exist, and growing, thankfully. The third Judaism is Talmudic Judaism. They persecuted Jewish believers. Now that word synagogue, episunagage from Thessalonians, means a gathering. Okay? Jesus used the term synagogue of Satan. A Jehovah's Witness kingdom hall is a synagogue of Satan. It's a gathering of Satan. It misleads people into hell. A mosque is a synagogue of Satan. But that also applies to Talmudic Judaism. It is a false religion. Much the same as Eastern Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism, and liberal Protestantism are not biblical Christianity. Either is Talmudic Judaism the Judaism of Moses and the prophets. Where is the blood atonement? The sages themselves translated Leviticus 17 into the Septuagint without the shedding of blood. There's no forgiveness of sin. They have no forgiveness of sin. That which denies the father and son relationship is Antichrist. That is in large measure why the Jews will be deceived by this one who's going to come. He will make a treaty with them and break it. He'll deceive them and con them. It's because their religion is Antichrist. Why are the Muslims waiting for the Mahdi? Their religion is Antichrist. It denies the father-son relationship. This is central to understanding what is happening. But let's go further. We've already looked at the most important type of the Antichrist in the New Testament. Now I will show you the second most important type of the Antichrist in the New Testament. The second most important I speak of the Herodians, beginning with Herod the Great. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 2. Verses 7 and 8, Herod secretly called the Magi and ascertained from them the time the star appeared. He went to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for the child. When you found him, come to me, that I too may come and worship him. Now we know what he does. He goes and kills the male babies. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Luke, Luke's Nativity Narrative, chapter 2. It came about in those days that a decree was, went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was the governor of Syria, and all were proceeding to register for the census, everyone to his own city. When Jesus came the first time, Israel was somehow under the control of a Roman Empire. It was a protectorate, but effectively controlled. A Roman general named Pompey came and made a deal with the Jews, persuading them he could protect them. He enters the Holy of Holies in the temple. Whenever somebody other than the high priest on the Day of Atonement enters the Holy of Holies, it's a picture of the Antichrist. You understand? Only the high priest on the Day of Atonement, a shadow of Christ, could enter the Holy of Holies, the Kodesh Kodeshim, the Sanctum Sanctorum. Whenever you see somebody going into the Holy of Holies in the temple other than the high priest, foreshadowing Christ, it's a picture of the Antichrist the Roman general Pompey did that. The same thing is going to happen. There'll be a resurrected Roman Empire. The EU is the embryo of it. And a false peace that will be broken. You betrayed us. Or what do you expect? Now what happens? Notice Caesar Augustus orders a census. 
The Romans had deified certain of their emperors posthumously after they were dead. Caesar Augustus, whose name was Octavius, was the first emperor who was deified while he was alive. The Roman Senate deified him. So you have a man who was legally proclaimed to be God, ordering a census. Everybody was assigned a number. They didn't literally chisel the number on them, but they assigned a number to every head. That's what the Romans did. The word capital, capital comes from the same in Latin, the Roman language, was the head. So you had a resurrected Roman Empire that had some kind of economic dominion of what was then the known world, and a numbering of all the people was ordered. You understand? So when Jesus came the first time, you had this numbering of the people. It'll happen again. The deified emperors foreshadow the Antichrist when he comes the second time. The same as what happened in his first time happens the second time. Now we have tapes explaining this, a, a Jewish understanding of the nativity. But I'm dealing with only the Antichrist aspect. But then you have to understand how this came about. You had a mongrel Jew, Herod the Great. They didn't call him the Great because he was a great guy. He was a pretty lousy guy. He did some terrible things. Killed his own sons. Paranoid, xenophobe, all sorts. He was actually a Jew of Nabataean descent people who were like Moabites and that, who were converted under the, in the Hasmonean period. But he was a Jew for a religion of convenience, political convenience. He was a Roman surrogate. Culturally and politically, he was a Roman. Now what he did was, he took the temple, the second temple, Zerubbabel's temple, and he built a retaining wall around it, of which the western wall is still there, the Wailing Wall. Filled it in. To this day, it's the biggest man-made plateau in the world to this day. And he took Greco-Roman architecture, combining that with Ezekiel's vision of the Millennial Temple. And he expanded the Second Temple. The Antichrist will do the same thing. He will counterfeit the Millennium. You understand? He will attempt to counterfeit the Millennial Reign of Christ. Once he gets power, then he shows his true colors. But at first, he seems like a good guy. Now, when you understand this, you understand the dangers of the incipient dominion theology. Kingdom Now theology. People like uh, Rick Godwin in America, now caught in a financial scandal. Or the people who went to dominionism. The vineyard people. This kind of stuff. Kingdom Now. We're going to conquer the whole world for Christ before he comes and set up his kingdom. And from this, they get into this idea of reconstructionism. That the church should take over the instruments of government and set up the millennial kingdom now. Kingdom now. Kingdom now. Kingdom now. They have no idea what they are playing with. Jesus said his kingdom is not of this world. We're establishing the kingdom. Oh, the kingdom's within you. Thy kingdom come. Last thing that Jesus said, the apostles asked, was that this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel. The kingdom is never restored to the church. <laughs> never. The only place the Bible speaks of the restoration of the kingdom is to Israel. Therefore, these people get into replacement theology. There is something much more sinister to replacement theology than replacement theology. Look out for these guys like John Piper. I'm telling you, they're off the wall. Watch out for hyper-Calvinists who get into replacement theology, especially the ones who get into dominion theology. Watch out for people, the hyper-charismatics who get into the kingdom now stuff. Again, they're being set up for a delusion. It's not like this. Herod was a Jew by religion, for religion of convenience, in league with the Romans. It may be this will happen again. You've got these two beasts, one a Jew, somehow, one a Gentile, the growth of the European Union. Now let's look further. Herod the Great, he wants to stay king. Therefore, he tries to prevent Jesus from being born. Kills all the male children, doesn't he? The wise men knew who he was and he knew what to do about it. Well, the wise men are going to know again. Turn with me, please, to Revelation chapter 12. 
A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of twelve stars. This goes back to Joseph's vision in the book of Genesis chapter 24. She was with child and cried out being in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten hordes and on his head were seven diadems. His tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Obviously, it's generally believed a third of the demons followed, angels followed Satan and became demons, but there'll be a massive backsliding at the end. God told Abraham his descendants would be like the stars of heaven, and a third of them were swept down in one fell swoop. She gave birth to a male son who's to rule the nations with a rod of iron. He's going to get the power of the baby. Well, the dragon goes crazy. Verse 7, there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. Both Daniel and Revelation show us the conflicts in the Middle East strategically are simply reflections of the conflict in the Middle East spiritually. Daniel saw the battle between Michael and the prince of Persia, the principality of Persia. Daniel makes it clear in chapter 10 and chapter 12 that the final conflict in the Middle East will involve Iran. It says it directly. There's more to Akhmanijad than Akhmanijad. It's the principalities that Daniel saw. What you see with this Akhmanijad and these fundamentalist Shia Muslims in Iran and in groups like uh, Hamas, this is very much what Daniel saw. It is the prince of Persia. It's the principality. Now some people call these things territorial spirits. The biblical term is principality, translated from the Greek arche, arche. There are such things as territorial spirits, but that's not what the Bible calls them. The term is principality. Remember, again, Serene, the demon said to Jesus, don't send us out of the region. Okay? There are demonic powers over these nations. Now, this is a whole other subject. I only mentioned it in passing, but let's continue with Revelation. The dragon comes down and tries to kill the woman. Okay? And we read what happens. You have the dragon and the serpent. Satan has two modes of attack, always the dragon and the serpent. The dragon is Satan, the persecutor. The serpent is Satan, the seducer. Remember, the serpent beguiled the woman. The way that Satan beguiled, seduced Eve, is the way he tries to seduce Israel and the church. We have the dragon and the serpent. Well, in the last days, we're dealing with both persecution and deception at the same time. Now, let's continue with this. He goes after the woman. Verse 17, the woman, she manages to escape, okay? And the baby is caught up, and she doesn't get the, the dragon doesn't get the baby. Verse 14, the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman in order that she might fly to the wilderness where she was nourished for a time, times, and a half time from the presence of the serpent. But then in verse 17, the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. What did you have in the story of the nativity? Herod wants to keep power. The woman is going to give birth to the baby who's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Herod has to try to kill the baby, but the baby is supernaturally protected. The woman flees. They go into Egypt. Then Herod goes and kills the rest of the offspring. Remember, he kills all the babies in Bethlehem. Herod is a major type of the Antichrist in the New Testament, second only to Judas. Now understand how this works. The serpent beguiled the woman. The serpent. The fall of man has affected us in different ways. Men have become insensitive. Women have become hypersensitive. The serpent always goes after the woman, not the man. The man will kill him. The dragon goes after the man. Men have become insensitive. Women have become hypersensitive as a result of the fall. When a husband and wife get saved, most of the time it's the wife who gets saved first. If the husband gets saved first, although there are exceptions, the wife usually will also become a Christian. Usually, not always, but usually. Water will take the shape of its container. 
But there are many godly women with unsaved husbands who go through years, even decades of grief. Why is it that women get saved easier than men? When a husband and wife pray for direction, it is usually the wife who hears from the Lord first and clearest. Why? Women are more sensitive. The fall has made men insensitive. Men are reliant on female sensitivity. However, anything God intends and created for good, the world, the flesh, and the devil will use for evil. So while men had become insensitive because of the fall, the homotosphere is the theological term, women have become hypersensitive. While it is easier for women to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, it is also much easier for women to fall into spiritual seduction and hear the voice of a counterfeit spirit. Women are much more vulnerable to spiritual seduction. Men are reliant on female sensitivity. Women are reliant on male protection. Paul talks about those who prey on widows and they prey on weak women, captivate them. They get sucked in. It's something in the nature of women. The fall has affected men one way, it's affected women in the other. Men are reliant on female sensitivity, women are reliant on male protection. Understand this thing with the woman now. This is a big deal. The earring lady with the facelifts. I saw her on a DVD in Australia several months ago. And this is what she said. When you give money to the Lord, meaning her ministry, God gives you a receipt, it says in the original languages, she said, which she learned from some other money preacher. So therefore, when you want something, you bring your receipt to God. Now, it so happens I know the original languages. The Hebrew word for receipt is Kabbalah. We get the word Kabbalah, mystical Judaism. doesn't apply. In Greek, we have two words for receipt. One is Arabanon. We usually translate it as earnest. The Arabanon is the Holy Spirit. When you're born again, you get the Holy Spirit. So when the Lord comes to pick up his parcel, redemption, he comes to redeem what's his, he comes and he sees his Arabanon. That one has the Holy Spirit. He takes them. We've already been bought, but he hasn't picked up the parcel yet. Like if you order something from a shopping center and, and it sees a Roebuck or something, and you go pick it up a week before Christmas. Well, you've got the Arabanon. You've got the, the Arabanon is the sticker with the number on it. And when the Lord comes, he simply puts the two numbers together and takes his parcel. That's one word, Arabanon. The other word for receipt is to telestai, to telestai, paid in full. When Jesus took my sin and yours and we put our faith in him and repented and accepted him and were born again, stamped on, paid in full. Those are the two Greek words for receipt. She says, when you give money to God, meaning her organization by implication, you get a receipt and you go to God, here, here, here's my receipt, cough it up. The earth is the Lord and all it contains. God is no man's better. If God is no man's better, how can we go to him with a receipt and say, cough it up? But she tells people, that's what the original languages teach. She's either an ignoramus or a liar or both. Now whether Joyce Meyer is a liar, a blithering ignoramus, or both, I'll let somebody else decide. I'm not her judge. I only judge what she's teaching. She's a deceiver. That woman is from the devil. In the first edition of her first book, she said directly, unless you believe Jesus went to hell, you can't go to heaven. Following the whole muddiness from William Branham and, and, and E.W. Kenyon. She is a complete and utter deceiver. Paula White just left her next husband. She's got rid of him, but she's still on TV. Juanita Byram and her husband were out doing Christian marriage seminars. They pulled her husband off her about two months ago. He was kicking her teeth down her throat in a, in a parking lot outside of a church. You understand what's happening. The feminism of the secular world is getting into the church. The serpent beguiles the woman. 
Do I blame the women? No. You know who I blame? The men for not taking responsibility. If the men were taking responsibility, we wouldn't have this stupid garbage. You understand, the serpent goes after the woman in the last days. The same as he did in the garden, it happens again. It's happening. He's working through these women. They're teaching fundamental error, heresy. Look at their own lives. But let's continue with these Herodians. Herod dies as one of his sons who didn't get around to killing comes to power. Turn with me to the book of Acts, please, chapter 12. Riots are taking place because of Paul and because of Peter. But at Caesarea, verse 20, we read, Now he was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and with one accord they came to him, having won over Blastus, the king's chamberlain. They were asking for peace because their country was fed by the king's country. And on an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. And the people kept crying out, the voice of a God, not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and died. Notice why they deified him and proclaimed him to be a God. Because he fed the king's country. The Antichrist will attempt to get control of the world's food supply. Nobody can buy or sell without the number of the beast. He comes out all decked out in his royal robes and delivers a fiery address. The voice of a God! He allows people to deify him. Whenever you see any man other than the Lord Jesus Christ worshipped as God and they accept the worship, that is an antichrist. When they try to worship Paul and Barnabas, don't do that, don't do that. Antichrist will say, go ahead and do it. We have to understand the house of Herod, particularly their relationship to Israel, to understand what the Antichrist is going to do. The house of Herod was a linchpin between the deified Roman emperors and Israel. And of course, they were the first ones to go on the warpath against the early church. This is going to happen again. Let's continue. So we have the most important type, shadow, of the beast in the New Testament is Judas the second of the Herodians. Solomon is the most important in the Old Testament. Let us look at the one who is most important intertestamentally. That 400 plus year period between Malachi and John the Baptist. Turn with me please to Daniel chapter 11. Verse 21, after one is shattered in verse 20, in his place a despicable person will arise on whom the honor of kingship has not been conferred, but he will come in a time of tranquility and seize the kingdom by intrigue. And the overflowing forces will be flooded away before him and shattered, and also the prince of the covenant. And after an alliance is made with him, he will practice deception. He will go up and gain power with a small force of people. In a time of tranquility, he will enter the richest areas of the realm and will accomplish what his fathers never did, nor his ancestors. He will distribute, plunder, booty, and possessions among them. And he will devise his schemes against strongholds, but only for a time. He will stir up strength and courage against the king of the south with a large army, so the king of the south will mobilize an extremely large army, and mighty army for war, but he will not stand, for schemes will be devised against him. And those who eat his choice food will destroy him. His army will overthrow, but will fall down slain. As for both kings, their hearts will be intent on evil. They'll speak lies to each other at the same table, but will not succeed, for the end is still to come at the appointed time. Then he will return to his land with much plunder, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. He will take action and then return to his own land. At that appointed time, he will return and come to the south, but this last time it will not turn out as the way it did before, for ships from Ketum 
probably Cyprus, will come against him, therefore he will be disheartened and he will return and become enraged at the Holy Covenant and take action. He will come back and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. And forces from him will arise, desecrate the sanctuary fortress, do away with the regular sacrifice, and will set up the abomination of desolations, the Shikuts HaMeshomem. And by smooth words he will turn to godlessness those who act wickedly towards the covenant. But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. Those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many. Yet they will fall by sword, by flame, by captivity, by plunder for many days. Now when they fall, they will be granted a little help and many will join with them in hypocrisy. And those, some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine and purge and make them pure until the time of the end because it's still to come at the appointed time. Then the king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will speak monstrous things against the god of gods. He will prosper until the indignation is finished, for that which is decreed will be done. And he will show no regard for the god of his fathers or the desire of women, etc., etc. Up to verse 36, we have a partial historical fulfillment in Antiochus Epiphanes. He only went up to verse 36. From verse 36 onward, the rest of it has never happened. Antichrist will come in the character of Antiochus. He will do the same kind of things Antiochus did, but then he will go on from verse 36 and do the rest of it, including an abomination of desolation. What Antiochus did was he took a statue of the Greek god Zeus. Zeus was a corruption of the Greek Theos. The Greek word for God is Theos. Zeus was the corruption of it, who they identified with the planet Jupiter. And giving the statue of Zeus his own features, he puts it in the temple. And he slaughters a pig an unkosher animal on the altar defiling the temple. This is the abomination of desolations, hashikutz hameshomem, it's Aramaic, not Hebrew. Now in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus said, when you see the abomination spoken of by Daniel, let the reader understand. Notice that Jesus took something that already happened and said it's going to happen again. On what basis can we say, how do you know it cuts off and then it goes on and... Because Jesus said so, it has to happen again. But we know from the historical record and the biblical record, no other such thing happened after verse 36. From verse 36 on, it must take place. Up to verse 36, it's going to happen again. But then the Antichrist is going to go all the way. Antiochus can only go so far. Types of the Antichrist can only go so far. They do some of what he's going to do, and they foreshadow him. They prefigure him but only he's going to go all the way. Same as with Jesus. Isaac was sacrificed, his father gave him up to be sacrificed, and in fig he was resurrected, and Moses gave a covenant. The types, the shadows of Jesus, did some of what Jesus did. But then Jesus comes in their character, does what they did, and goes beyond it and does the whole bit. What's true for Christ is true for the Antichrist. You understand? Satan always tries to counterfeit. Well, how do you understand the counterfeit? You understand the original. If you understand how the types of Christ teach about Christ from the Old Testament, you'll understand how the types of the Antichrist teach about the Antichrist. Okay? Now let's go further with this. Something happened. First of all, you had a change in geopolitical conflict. It went to a north-south scenario. The kings of the north, the kings of the south. Before the Iron Curtain came down, the focus of geopolitical conflict in the world began to shift, not between the capitalistic west and the communistic east, but between the northern and southern hemispheres, between the developed world and the developing world. The first North-South War was the Falklands. 
The second was the first war in the Gulf. This was the next one in Iraq. The focus of geopolitical conflict went from east-west to north-south. This is the issue now. This is happening again. Same kind of thing. Same kind of thing. The Mexicans are afraid of illegal immigration from Guatemala. You know that? They really are. People in America don't realize that. It's a big deal down there in southern Mexico. Well, people in Texas are afraid of immigration from Mexico. People in Australia are afraid of Indonesia, even though Australia is south of Indonesia, it's still a northern developed economy. All over the world is the same. But it will be particularly the same in the Mediterranean basin. Islamic North Africa and the Middle East invading Europe, that becomes the focus. The kings of the north versus the kings of the south. Somehow, Antichrist will arise and try to sort this out. People will be so terrified, they'll be looking for anybody. When I was a little boy in New York, Nikita Khrushchev came to Manhattan during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The guy was absolutely nuts. Took off his shoe, and he began pounding it on the podium in the UN General Assembly, we will bury you, we will bury you. He apparently had a fondness for vodka. Within a matter of weeks, the Soviet Politburo, Kosygin and Suslav and, and so forth, and uh, Andropov, they said, we can't have this nut with his finger on the button. During the Watergate crisis, if you read the book, The Final Days, Nixon was stoned on tranquilizers and alcohol. Haig and Kissinger were trying to keep him under control. He was trying to exploit the political crisis in the Middle East to save his own neck politically. He called the stage three nuclear alert against the Soviets. Within no time, the Republican Party establishment, people like Barry Goldwater, turned against him. General Ford made him resign. You cannot have a nut with his finger on the button. The Soviets at least thought rationally. The Americans thought rationally. Islam does not think rationally. Push the button. Jihad. The only assurance of salvation in Islam is to be shahadi, to die in a jihad. India has nuclear weapons. The BJP, fundamentalist Hindus. They'll die for Hinduism. Push the button. They'll be reincarnated as a Brahmin. They don't think rationally. These are not rational religions. Islam is an irrational religion. When you face a nuclear threat from the develop, developing world, imagine the only thing that has to happen. One small nuclear device to go off in London or New York or Paris or Tokyo, the economy of the Western world will turn to gelatin. They'll be so terrified, they will follow anybody. One possible scenario. It doesn't have to happen, just an imminent threat of it happening. It is easy to see how somebody can come and try to sort this out. But somebody is going to come in the character of Antiochus. Now, as Daniel prophesied, something happened that happens again. You had a very rapid change of political events in the days of Daniel, or that Daniel saw the rise and fall of a series of world empires happened very, very quickly. It transpired overnight. And in the middle of all of it, the Jews went back to their land. Everybody was terrified of Assyria. Overnight, they collapsed. Nobody could believe it. They were the ones everybody feared. They were the ones who put the ten northern tribes into captivity and destroyed Samaria in 721 B.C. The Jews were terrified of them. Everybody was. But overnight, they were gone you have the meteoric rise of Babylon. But then as Daniel prophesies, fallen, fallen is Babylon, Babylon's gone. Maybe a Persia. Then out of nowhere comes Alexander the Great, son of Philip II, and they're gone. Then Alexander, about the age of 36, dies in the edge of Belushistan somewhere, and his empire fragments the four of his generals. Two most important, Ptolemy and Seleucus. 
Ptolemy getting Egypt and southern Israel, Seleucus getting Lebanon, Syria, Galilee, and so forth. Of the Seleucids comes the dynasty of Antiochus. Antiochus the first, the second, the third, and Antiochus the fourth. That is Antiochus Epiphanes, or Epimanus, as the Jews called him, the mad. He's the one who sets up the image in the temple. But he had an agenda. Those who despise the covenant. He had to seduce God's people. He began outlawing reading of the Torah. He began outlawing circumcision. And he began invading, not strategically, but culturally, imposing a very decadent Greek culture that involved everything from socially acceptable homosexuality, lesbianism, and bisexuality to violence as entertainment on the Jews. And there were Jews who collaborated and went along with it. They just went along, went along, went along until you couldn't stop it. Some just stayed there and did nothing. Others collaborated like Menelaus. This is what happened. So it got to the point they couldn't stop him anymore, and he went into the temple and did his thing. He puts in the abomination of desolation, the shikutsa meshramen. Let me explain this to you from Aramaic. Meshramem is the modern Hebrew word for boring, but it's actually of Aramaic origin. It means desolate. Shikuts, however, is another word. Shikuts comes from the Hebrew word shekets. Shekets, meaning a slimy reptile. The word shekets is where you get the derogatory Yiddish word for a Gentile woman, shiksa. The word shekets, or sheketzim, plural, occurs many places in the Bible, but we usually translate it or mistranslate it, your detestable things. Remember, as I said last night, when Israel went into idolatry, God called the idolatry adultery. Daughter of Zion, you played the harlot under every green thing, and with your sheketzim, your detestable things. This is the shekets. The serpent. It is usually used for Baal worship, who the Babylonians called Marduk. And they even had a resurrection myth that Baal rose from the dead every spring. There were holidays, religious festivals to Baal, on the same days as the Jewish holidays prescribed in the Torah and Leviticus. It can look so much like it. Baal. You got a Baal, we got a Baal, must be the same Baal. You have an Allah, we have an Allah, must be the same Allah. You have a Jesus, we have a Jesus, must be the same Jesus. We explained this last night. In other words, what's going to happen is the serpent, spiritual seduction, is going to be used to take God's woman. You understand? Seven times. The New Testament calls the church the temple. Seven times. We have different Greek words for temple. Naos, Heron, Oikos, Hegios. Seven times the church is called the temple. Now there will be a, a tribulational temple in Revelation chapter 11. I do not deny there will be a temple, and I do not deny that Antichrist will put an abomination in it. But understand what that really means. When Jesus died, the temple veil, the vilon it's called, was torn from the ceiling to the ground. A literal, physical, visible event happened in the literal, physical, visible temple. But that's not what was most important. What was most important is what it meant. As we read in Hebrews, sinful man was no longer separated from holy God. The literal event was simply a picture of what was happening spiritually in the temple. The temple's rebuilt, and there's an image in it that will only be a reflection of something spiritual. Antichrist will be worshipped in Christendom, you understand. He'll be worshipped in popular Christendom, the same as the Jews followed Antiochus and couldn't stop him until it was too late. 
This happens again. He'll do everything Antiochus did up to verse 36, but then he'll go on and do the rest. But how will he pull it off? The same way he pulled it off the first time. A cultural invasion of God's people. Not just Israel. Turn on the idiot box. So-called Christian TV is so worldly, even the world makes fun of it. Instead of worship, we have entertainment, the worship of worship. What used to be the Christian music ministry is now the Christian music industry. Record companies in Nashville owning Christian record companies. Same with the Christian publishing industry. These things have become industries. They're like the world. They look like the world. The Greeks imposed a bisexual and homosexual lesbian culture. What's Rick Warren's man, Brian McLaren, saying? We should declare a moratorium on debating the homosexual issue in the church. Let's ordain them, others have done. This is the same thing that happened under Antiochus, you understand? But it happened because so many of God's people either compromised with it and did nothing and behaved like cowards and kept their mouths shut or actually actively collaborated with it. It's happening again. The abomination's already being set up in the temple. Let's look. There were people, however, a family of priests, Maccabees, at a village called Modai, not far from Jerusalem, in an area called the Shvilah, where the prophet Micah was from. He had five sons. Who did the Maccabee and his five sons? Two of the five were betrayed from within their own ranks. We're told many will join with them in hypocrisy. These Maccabees understood what was happening. And it says those who know their God will take action. These are the ones in verses 33 and 35. Those who have understanding, insight, will give understanding to the many. Those of us who know what's going on will blow the trumpet and warn the rest of the people. But many will join with us in hypocrisy and some of those who have insight will fall. They'll try to kill us. There are people who will join themselves to somebody like myself or Dave Hunt or David Hawking simply because they see us as sounding boards to be against what they're against. You cannot build fellowship on what you're against only on what you're for. You understand? There are people who will find fault with any church. They only like me because I'll speak out, but if given enough time, they'll fall out with me. Many will join with them in hypocrisy. But let's look. I saw this happen. There were people who always liked me, but once the Pensacola thing happened and the Toronto thing happened, they were against me. Well, it's going to be like that. Yet these Maccabees had understanding. They told people, they warned people. And they began to fight back with some success. Eventually rededicating the temple. That was the Feast of Hanukkah that Jesus celebrated in John 10. The first one they killed, however, was not a Seleucid Greek or a Syrophoenician soldier. The first one they knocked off was Menlaus, a Jewish collaborator. Pay attention. Our most dangerous enemies, your most dangerous enemies, the most dangerous enemies to the cause of Christ today are not unbelievers. The most dangerous enemies we face today, the most serious threat to the body of Christ, it's not a Freemason or a pornographer or a gay activist or a film producer in Hollywood. The most dangerous enemies we face today are not militant Muslims. The most dangerous enemies we face today are our own backslidden leaders who will compromise with such people. Those who point God's people down the road of ecumenical compromise, 
the Menelaus syndrome. These are the first enemy. It may be controversial, but that's the way it is. Rick Warren and Chuck Colson are much more dangerous to the cause of Christ than Bin Laden. Bin Laden is an external enemy. We know what he is. We know who he is. We know what he will do. It is the cancer in the body that will kill. It's not the dragon. It's the serpent. I fear spiritual seduction within the church more than I fear persecution. And I've seen persecution in Africa and the Middle East. I'm not saying that's a good thing. Let's understand this. The Maccabees knew about Antiochus and took action. Those who know their God will display strength. Once again, God will have his Maccabees. Don't expect the mega churches to do anything except compromise. Very few mega churches will stand on the Word of God. It's those who headed to the hills with the Maccabees. It happens once again. There will be another Shekutsa Meshaman. The serpent is beguiling the woman. It's happening as we speak. God is looking to recruit Maccabees. Remember, before Jesus came the first time, all Jerusalem went out to the wilderness to hear John speak. John was the son of a high priest. He could have had a pretty good job within the Sanhedrin or within the Levitical establishment in Jerusalem. Why were the people going out into the wilderness to hear John the Baptist, Yohanan Amadbil? They should have been being taught the word of God in the temple by the Levites. They should have been learning the word of God from the Sanhedrin. But instead, they had to go out into the wilderness to hear John preach, to hear the word of God. Before Jesus comes, it'll be the same thing. There'll be a famine for the hearing of the word of God. You're not going to get the word of God in the mainstream denominations or within the megachurches. You're going to have to go out into the wilderness. You understand? It becomes so lukewarm, ultimately so backslidden, that they'll reject the Messiah. That's the way it was when he came the first time, and that's the way it's going to be when he comes again. But praise God, he is coming again soon. Here's the point. Maccabees. We need Maccabees. Wise men. We need wise men. We need people who can discern the times. Who know what's happening. Who say, wait a minute, look what's going on. The world is coming into the church. If I wanted a rock concert, I'd go to a rock concert. I don't come to church to go to a rock concert. The world is always going to have better rock concerts than the church. Always. The world's getting in. That's exactly what happened in the days of Antiochus. The world's gotten in. And too many people compromised to the point you couldn't stop the world from taking over. Now, instead of standing up to Islam, 138 evangelical leaders, including move from Fuller Theological Cemetery, signed a statement lauding them. Come with me to Africa. I'll show you what Muslims do to Christians when they have the upper hand. Come with, I'll take you to Sudan, Mr. Mu. You understand what's happening here? But now it has reached the corridors of power. It has reached even the White House. I have been from one end of the Muslim world to the other. I have been from Morocco. I have been to Egypt. I've been to the Persian Gulf. I've been to Jordan. I've been to Turkey. I've been to Brunei. I've been to Malaysia. I've been to Indonesia. I've been all over the Muslim world. My president, who says he's a Christian, tells me it's a religion of peace and tolerance. 
I have not seen peace or tolerance anywhere in the Muslim world. I defy President Bush or any other phony politician to show me one place in the Muslim world where there's peace or tolerance, where Christians have the rights he gives them here. He puts a Quran in the White House and celebrates Ramadan. This is exactly what happened in Daniel 11. The only difference is, where are the Maccabees? Who is giving understanding to the many? Who is blowing the trumpet in Zion? Who will stand up and say anything? They are so intimidated by political correctness and the fear of man that they'd rather watch the whole thing go down the tubes. It has already happened in Great Britain and Europe. The Christians in Britain and Europe have to face the fact that their children and their grandchildren can have no Christian future in Europe. You understand? There is no Christian future in Western Europe or Great Britain for your children or your grandchildren. That is coming here, and it's coming here quickly. It is the spirit of Antichrist. The stage is being set. Even as we speak right now. If you heard what I said, and you agree with me, that doesn't impress me. Because it doesn't mean anything. But if you heard what the Word of God is saying, and you become a Maccabee, you take action. You get insight and give understanding to the many. That will mean everything. God bless. We hope you have enjoyed Grounded in the Word with Jacob Prash. We hope this teaching ministry is a blessing to you and a tool to equip you with the understanding of God's Word so you will not be deceived by today's false teachers. Please visit our website at moriel.org, M-O-R-I-E-L dot O-R-G, and sign up for the Moriel Ministries newsletter. Join us again next week for another helping of the meat of God's Word.